I'm here with Nina Valens, who is a lawyer and who is a founding member of and spokeswoman for the Victorian Women's Guild. Uh, we're going to talk about the conversion therapy bill currently before the VEC Parliament, uh, a version of which is likely to be introduced in Tasmania early next year as well. Uh, so there's been some vocal opposition to the bill from free speech advocates and from religious groups, uh, but less well publicised is the opposition to the bill from gay and lesbian groups like the LGB Alliance Australia and from feminist groups, of which the Victorian Women's Guild is one. So Nina, first question, uh, a descriptive one. What is this bill doing? Uh, what does it change and who is it targeting? So the purpose of the bill is to uh, prohibit um, so-called conversion therapy um, aimed at both same-sex attracted people and people questioning their gender identity um, to establish a scheme to investigate reports of these practices um, and to punish uh, with criminal sanctions such practices where they cause injury. Mm -hmm. Um, and it also includes some amendments to the Equal Opportunity Act, uh, you know, which, which is our anti-discrimination law. So um, it changes definitions of sexual orientation and gender identity. So in theory, or in intention, the bill targets people who are same-sex attracted or who question their gender identity. But that's not actually built into the bill. So technically it could also be used for, for example someone who is heterosexual and is questioning their heterosexual identity mm -hmm. and wants to convert so-called to um homosexuality you know there's nothing in the bill actually which which sets it up as protecting that particular group mm -hmm. though it's obviously clear in its intention um it targets in terms of uh, whose practice would be prohibited. Um, it targets potentially everyone. Um, it targets particularly health service providers and religious sort of people. Yeah. Um, but the bill is drafted in such broad terms that it, it you know, brings a, a very wide range of conduct within its mandate. Right. So do I understand it correctly that it's anything that's one to one? So kind of any kind of adult in a professional relationship who could be plausibly accused of inducing a person to change or trying to suppress their identity, like teachers, for example, or is that a fair example? Like like lots of people outside of the clinical practices. Um, yeah, so, you know, what the bill does is it has a definition of practice mm -hmm. and it says it includes but it's not limited to essentially types of therapy, then types of religious practice and then referrals to those practices. Right. But because it says includes but is not limited to, obviously that can include lots of other types of conduct too. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if a matter like this were to come to a court, and the court was required to interpret this law, you know, what they would tend to do is say, well, is this a practice like therapy or is it a practice like a religious practice? Mm -hmm. um, but they don't have to do that, you know, and you could certainly construct an argument that, yes, a teacher um, had been trying to suppress a person's identity uh, and you rely on the courts then mm -hmm. to interpret this narrowly. Mm -hmm. uh, so I say that that's really bad law. Like, for drafting law, we should make it easier for courts to interpret rather than Leaving wide it to and them. ambiguous. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, that's super helpful. Um, so what uh, what what is the need for the bill? Like what problem in the state or in the country of Australia or whatever is this bill responding to? Yeah, so that's a very good question, Holly. Um, it's a problem of perception, right? So in 2018, the Human Rights Law Centre and La Trobe University did a study looking at so-called conversion therapy in Victoria. And they documented some really tragic stories of same-sex attracted people who'd been through, um, you know, these kind of conversion practices and the really deep harm that it caused them. Yeah. And then the report also contained some assertions that there was so-called conversion therapy aimed at transgender people um, but they had no evidence of this no evidence of these practices there's like some reference of course to the australian christian lobby but there's no actual evidence 
of what these practices are and what constitutes them. So you have these stories of what happened to same-sex attracted people, but no stories of what happened to transgender people. Right. So then that led the Andrews government to referring the matter to their health care commissioner, who did an inquiry into conversion practices. And again, um, it looks like they just looked at conversion practices aimed at same-sex attracted people. For some reason, the commission only released a like two and a half page executive summary of the report. Don't know why they haven't released the whole thing. And then that led to a consultation by the Department of Justice and Community Safety on the issue of conversion um, therapy. And they've got a 29 page report, again, which only contains stories of conversion practices aimed at same sex attracted people. Right. So we have this bill, which is saying, well, you can't change or suppress sexual orientation or gender identity, but there's no evidence that there's any change or suppression practices aimed at people based on gender identity occurring in Victoria. So what are we banning? Yeah. Do you have any sense personally of why gender identity has kind of been added in? Like, do you think they just they just kind of assume that they're the same, so anything that applies to the one applies to the other? Or, I mean, what, do you have a best guess as to what's going on there? Yeah, I mean, I guess, like, you certainly see that happening, you know, all the time, sexual orientation and gender identity are lumped together, even though they refer to two very different things. Yeah. Um, and I think that probably a large part of the well-meaning public or the well-meaning public service don't don't see them as different. You know, mm. oh, they're, they're, they're people who challenge norms, you know, they're, they're oppressed, they're marginalised, we must support them. Um, but... You know, there's that well-known report now by Denton's and Thompson Reuters, which looks at transgender activism, and they say you slip in um, rights for or an interest of transgender people alongside gay and lesbian rights, and I think that that is what has happened here. It looks like Jill Hennessy, the Attorney General, has been lobbied, you know, quite strongly by people representing the interests of transgender people yeah. to just kind of slip this in. Yeah. And it doesn't look like it's been written by lawyers, to be honest. Yeah, I noticed that too. <laughs> yeah. Some of the language, yeah. And they actually, yeah. they thank the activists, don't they, at the end of the second yeah. reading. Um, so it's clear yeah, that they've I mean, been involved. Yeah, I mean, that's probably pretty standard that you'd thank the activists, but it, it makes you raise questions about who's really been in the ear of the Attorney General in, um, in proposing this bill and getting the Office of Counsel to draft it. Yeah, right. Okay, good. So uh, feminists, what should feminists be most worried about in the bill? And how does the bill stand to harm the interests of women and girls, if you think it does? Um, I mean, I guess there's there's two kind of areas which are really concerning here. And I think one of them is generally, you know, how are we going to respond to people who present with gender dysphoria? Yeah. And... I think just from a um, who who might suffer the most harm sort of approach, it's you know really the questions about what impact will this have on children yeah. um, and youth, teenagers who present to clinics questioning their gender identity or you know therapists questioning their gender identity, will they receive therapy which takes a wait and watch approach or will they only receive a kind of affirmation model? Yeah. Um, and the reason why feminists should be really concerned about that is because we know that the fastest growing group of people who present with gender dysphoria are teenage girls. Yeah. And we know that if you leave those teenage girls, um, uh, you know, sort of to progress through puberty and to mature, the majority of them come out as lesbians. Yeah. So effectively, you know, the affirmation model is a form of con- conversion therapy aimed at young lesbian women. So I think that's something that feminists and women should be really concerned about. Yeah. And then we should also be really concerned about the definitions of um, gender identity and sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the Equal Opportunity Act, it protects women's rights. Um, it, It allows discrimination, it allows positive discrimination to protect women's access to sports to shelters um jobs you know things like that things where our kind of intimate parts might be um relevant for example you know uh, a workplace could only employ 
could choose to employ female cleaners only to clean women's toilets. So yeah. if you're having a mammogram, you know, the employer can employ women only in those roles. Yeah. Um, so uh, the Equal Opportunity Act allows discrimination, positive discrimination and guards against negative discrimination. And then the question is where sex interacts with gender identity. So you're not allowed to discriminate on the basis of gender identity. And what this bill does is it completely, like already the notion of gender identity is, is a bit confusing and conflicts with sex. That's what I thought now already. Now we have an even worse definition, okay. which means absolutely nothing. Yeah. Um, the old definition refers to identifying as a member of the opposite sex. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's at least still got some things in it which kind of people recognise and make sense. And you can create categories around it. Like if you want to protect a class of person, you've got to know who constitutes that class. Yeah. The current definition, oh, sorry, the proposed definition of gender identity says um, basically gender identity is a person's gender identity. It's so circular. Helpful. Yes. Um, <laughs> and it refers to each dress. So, um, you know, on days when I'm wearing pants, is my gender identity male? Mm. You know, when I wear a dress, am I female? Like, it's it's just such a retrograde definition. Like, we're going back to the 1950s when you're talking about dress and mannerisms and so on. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. That was super helpful. Final question. Um, what does the Victorian Women's Guild want? Uh, and should the bill be rejected outright? Are there amendments that, that we can try to push for? And if so, what are the amendments that you'd like to see? So a lot of members of the Guild are lesbian women. Um, and, you know, I think particularly for our lesbian sisters who are older, you know, they really experienced a lot of discrimination and violence yeah. um, during their younger years and still discrimination today. So I think for them to have uh, suppression or change practices um, prohibited is meaningful in a symbolic sense at yeah. least because I don't know really how much these practices still occur today. So if there's a really urgent need to prohibit them or if it's more a symbolic measure that, you know, that could be useful. Yeah. At the same time, you know, for me, my personal opinion as a lawyer is I think that this bill is really badly written. Um, I think that it should, it should be delayed. Like it needs to go out to... A consultation process you know, there needs to be an exposure draft you need to have more lawyers commenting on it and not lawyers like the free speech group liberty victoria which has already said that they wholeheartedly approve this bill even though it's got like terrible examples of government overreach mm. uh, which is just embarrassing from a legal perspective that they support it so anyway i mean maybe at this point in time you'd still pass it in relation to conversion practices aimed at um same-sex attracted people but everything relating to gender identity needs to be put on the shelf yeah so that we can actually work out what on earth they mean there's also and i didn't mention this before there's a new definition of sexual orientation and i think all of my lesbian sisters would be horrified by this definition because it talks about attraction based on gender which as you will remember refers to how someone dresses and their mannerisms Mm -hmm. Um, and i think the very idea you know that Am I attracted to men because they wear pants or because they're men? Mm-hmm. Are my lesbian sisters attracted to women because those women, like what? I yeah. mean, lesbian women are almost like by definition non-conforming, right? Yeah. yeah. So what, what's the dress that, you know, is the basis of their attraction? So that also needs to go, that, um, that change in definition. And we need to be really careful too about the changes to the family violence and personal safety um, acts which include examples of change and suppression practices uh, I think yeah we just really need time to think about would this make a parent who refuses to affirm their child's gender identity um, be considered to be committing a form of emotional abuse yeah and therefore subject to the sanction of a family violence intervention order so there's a lot of things which really should not be passed as it stands. And the Guild, you know, argues very strongly, very strongly for that. 
Great. Thank you so much for your time. Um, it's very much appreciated. Thank you.